Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. What's up, folks? Yep, your iPhone, your watch, your clock on your wall if you're old-fashioned. It's correct. It's time for another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show. Yay! Where we talk about all things like music, motivation, success. These are the things that drive us, inspire us, inform us. Usually I have a co-host, co-producer, Jim McCarthy. Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com. Jim is doing some really incredibly important thing today. He would always never choose to miss our guest, but this is... Long time overdue, and we have such history. So I get today's guest all to myself, and we're going to get into it. Hailing from Minneapolis, Minnesota, Funky Town, uh, but calling L.A. home since 2000. Today's guest is a drummer, speaker, and educator. He's also the world's first polyvagal-informed professional drummer. The first polyvagal-informed professional drummer on the planet. Our friend, Adam Gust. What's up, my friend? Hey, Rich Redman. Good to see you again. What a history we have, man. <laughs> we went to the University of North Texas at the same time. I was there 93 to 95. What were, was that your yeah, exact? Exact same, yeah. And you were getting your undergraduate degree, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I never, I, man, I was so in love with Keith Carlock. I was like, man, he left. I'm going to leave. <laughs> yeah, I never graduated. You never Besides, graduated? It was, the, it was the Berkeley model. <laughs> Is that it? Yeah, I just wanted to practice all day and play gigs every night. And when that became an option, I really just wanted to become the best drummer I could and I saw that as the best way to do that so well dude yeah. you put in the work and a lot of us had practice rooms we had practice room north practice room south uh I got back to campus I don't know if I told you but it had been 28 years but last March or May I got to campus same brown brick <laughs> not much has changed of course the city of denton has changed but that music business oh you get the you get the willies you know thinking about oh i got barriers coming up i got to play this excerpt on the xylophone i got to play this excerpt on the vibraphone i got to go in and i got to play this uh this uh jazz piece for ed Soph, and he's just going to be deconstructing me and eyeing <laughs> me and it was just got so but at least at 28 years later i was like oh i'm an accomplished professional i actually wrote a couple of books i'm actually gonna be talking about my book today you don't have to worry about any of this stuff but it, it was cool man to yeah. uh the marimba to corrals i remember the marimba corrals were nice they were really musical yes i mean yeah, it was formal stuff yeah we had to like uh did you ever study um timpani mallets and snare drum with ron fink yeah so ron fink wrote in one of my method books i'll never remember it uh never forget it uh rich you are like a great sportsman always hunting and fishing for the notes <laughs> get it but uh, i wish i had a little wish i had a little splash symbol um so anyways you left so but you were you we were in the lab band program and then you i believe you were in were you in the zebras the fusion yeah group? i did that yeah and Matt, i don't know if your audience knows but i remember you having to be the sub drummer or uh the practice drummer for the Chad yeah, zappa percussion ensemble which was extremely challenging music you were in the one o'clock lab band yeah. you were also doing top 40 backbeat blues gigs i mean you could have done whatever you wanted and oh. so i know you definitely kind of facilitated towards being the you know world's best country drummer but uh yeah i mean it, I, I just find your audience to know man when i knew you you were doing it all so. oh thank you man well they, you know it, it's the same thing my my model was like you were kind of modeling yourself after keith and of course i knew i had a practice room next to keith and i used to sub for him in dallas brass and electric major shoes to fill but i was like man this kid is going to go to new york city or los angeles he's going to change the world of course he did. Uh, my career model was just a guy like the, you know, Greg Bissonette, which is like prepare to play everything and see where the world takes you. And for some reason, by just asking a simple question in 1997, I asked a, um, a guy named Dan Nelson, who's playing a saxophone in a group called Soul Tsunami is one of those, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, working strip ball, strip mall, top 40 funk bands. <laughs> it's like, I need yeah. a, I want a regional gig a national gig or an international gig i've got to get out of dallas and he said man there's this chick named trisha yearwood that's looking for a drummer and then that was it just led me towards nashville 
Um, and yeah. your your uh, your path was you got as overeducated as humanly possible. You got a lot of experience playing in Dallas. Dallas has a healthy, vibrant music scene. You and I played in the same band. I played in a band called Random Access, and you <laughs> did as well. Yeah, that's true. Luke Adams, who's in L.A., he was in between us. And yeah, I remember I started doing that and Keith Carlock and Woj Wojo went out on the road. Keith moved to New York and suddenly there was more session work at the time. And yeah, yeah, was, that was actually an ideal time to be a professional drummer, like a good right place, right time. So yeah. I was able to put some, put some money away and move to L.A. in 2000. I'm so glad that you got to put some money away because I remember with those gigs, they paid like 80 bucks and then maybe the private parties paid like 175 or so. And of course, this was 25 years ago, but still, that doesn't go very far, you know? Yeah. Uh, my rent was stupidly cheap at the time, I remember. Yeah. And, yep. So you ended up moving to the L.A. area kind of with with Luke Adams and Blair Sinta and uh, who else? Craig Pilo. Yeah. All those guys, everybody went on to greatness playing with uh, Alanis Morissette or Pete Yorn or Frankie Valley. And yeah. so so you end up moving to L.A. And I remember there was one gig that I believe you and Craig shared. It was called the Red yeah. Elvises. Was <laughs> Tell us about that gig. But was that the, your first gig in Los Angeles? It was the first touring job. So yeah. I was doing home studio recording and playing. I remember I was doing a lot of like salsa cumbia in East LA, which was great. It was fun to watch Latinas dance, you know, at that time in my life. No complaints. Yeah. But uh, yeah, they they were touring constantly. And yeah, it's a crazy story. Red Elvises, they moved to uh, LA from Russia and they started playing the Third Street Promenade on the street. And a Star Search executive producer saw them and had them on star search you're and kidding were, me yeah that, and then they won and they took the money and bought a van and started touring and bringing this russian surf rock music to the world and yeah i toured toured with them for eight years u.s europe and russia crazy times in russia yeah it was it was fun i have never been to russia i i don't know if that's top of the list but had to be fun especially at the time right yeah, I played Live 8 uh, for 40,000 people in Red Square, televised around the world. That was a trip. Wow. Uh, that was probably the biggest gig I've ever played. So, yeah, coming yeah. home after that and seeing the bills stacked up when I got home, it was really kind of saw both ends of the music life, you know. Yes, <laughs> like, yes. Wow, I felt like I've arrived. I played this huge gig in Red Square. I remember, like, opening the door and seeing this stack of bills. I'm like, oh, there goes all my money. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so, That's cool. yeah, it's a roller coaster, this life we have. Yeah. Well, I'm also very curious about this time where you i remember um you know blair has been on the show i need to get luke adams on the show um but he was talking about you know playing smooth jazz gigs and you were playing this cumbia music in east la now when you say like east la are you talking about like this like dangerous parts of los angeles where you're like Drum set and a baseball bat kind yeah. of thing? Yeah. Yeah, I was dodging bullets on a loadout one night, I remember. Wow. And yeah. Yeah, the hop in City of Industry. That was a fateful night. Yeah, But, um, yeah, that was, I mean, I just looked around for gigs, and there was this band that was playing that circuit, doing weddings and casuals and club dates, and it was great, great band. And then, like, the Banda Brothers would sit in and after their gigs, and it got to meet a lot of people and ended up playing a lot of salsa cumbia. Like, wouldn't have expected that. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. I, but then, I, that, yeah, the Red Elvis thing came around perfect. and really loved that. And they kept paying me more every year, stuck with it for eight years and finally quit that. And then, yeah, had some fateful stuff happen after that's that. That's right. That's right. That's right. Now, I remember talking to you one time because I would get to Los Angeles like once a year or so with Aldean. I remember one time we were fortunate enough to like we sold out the house of blues on sunset of course that is now a gigantic apartment complex yeah. or business yeah. building a lot of glass it's so sad that we lost in another venue but i remember meeting you one 
night for a cocktail there and i were think you were with the red elvis at the time and we were chatting and we we're you know we were in the back room and the sun had set and we were uh looking out at the city of los angeles it was so sexy having a drink and we're we're talking about you were about to film a drum dvd would this have been in 2010 2011 or 2012 am i murky my memory yeah that was 2010 i was putting together a curriculum i was in the middle of shooting it and editing it and yeah then the, i had this accident on a gig and that really kind of halted that whole process i remember that yeah. okay so so that was right before that happened now um now let me ask you this accident that you speak of i don't know if you would like to discuss it but it seems to be the gateway the the hinge um that is a, a that set up all this incredible research and study and this personal journey that you've been on. So is this something you want to talk about or? Yeah. I mean, it was really the doorway to what has opened up these dreams that I never knew I had. So yeah. And there's just amazing things that I'm really excited about that have nothing to do with drumming that I'm more excited about that than like whatever gig I might get now. So right. yeah, I mean, it's really, yeah, like you said, the doorway. So yeah, I'm open to talking about it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I kind of assumed that we would spend a large portion of this talking about your, um, about this event that occurred and leading for you to become now a speaker and an educator. And you're one of the, now this is so popular with drummers. I actually, during, I think during COVID we got together at Granville there in West Hollywood, we had a little bit of a bite and a chat and we talked about TEDx's and during uh, COVID I wrote a TEDx and I just got to get off my butt and do it in person. But you presented one at the university of Mississippi called the science of groove. Um, this was your first presentation about the vagus nerve, which is our nervous system, super highway. And I've watched it several times and it's incredible. So tell us about the event and or the TED talk and this research and this new system of drumming that you're coming up with somatic drumming and the idea of the dystonia and the, the brain body system that we have and this concept of biometrics. I'm just going to let huh. you have the floor for a bit because you're so, so well spoken on this. And if no one is watching this on the YouTube, they're listening to this. I'll just say that Adam is handsome as ever, and he's wearing a pinstripe suit. He looks great. <laughs> hey, you know, you look much better with short hair. You look great. Oh, well, thanks. Yes. Yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, I've been reading a lot of research papers, and it's funny. I'm starting to feel more like a doctor than a drummer these days. <laughs> so maybe the hair suits me this way. But, yeah, generally no, the area of the wellness has really been transforming lately largely because of some technological advances in research and especially in the 90s there was a huge shift in how we were able to get imaging of our nervous system and how it works how neural transmissions from the brain to the body work instead of just snapshots we're able to actually watch it like movies and there are a lot of preconceptions we've had that are completely dismissed now things that we used to think were woo woo and new agey we realize now whoa okay no we've had it completely backwards uh, for hundreds of years <laughs> so yeah and i kind of got into this through this accident that i had i had a lot of tension problems that i now understood understand to have been symptoms of musicians focal dystonia a neurological disorder that only happens and during certain tasks which for musicians it's when you play music so yeah it can be really frustrating because you're perfectly fine when you're not at the drums and then when you sit down then this tension happens which is a really kind of yeah as we would look at it you see a drummer playing with tension it kind of can't help but think you know the word amateurish comes to mind you see some kid you know kind of all tensed up playing you're like oh yeah iron grip on the stick and like you make some judgments about that for, as a professional and so i started seeing that in myself and started feeling amateurish and yeah it was it was challenging so there was a six-year period where this this tension would manifest in your body when you would sit down to play and you were you were facing extreme frustration because you have been you know, practicing and perfecting your craft, you know, all these years and, and you have a beautiful uh, stroke and touch and tone you achieve on the instrument. So to have something that's taking you off course that you don't have control over had to be incredibly frustrating. Yeah, it just kept compiling 
felt like it kept getting worse as, you know, I would hope it would get better over a six year period mm -hmm. and it just didn't. And actually it was a interesting a mutual friend of ours, Mark Shulman. I remember him telling me like, you know, I remember talking to him like, man, I can't believe it took me six years to arrive at this solution. And Mark is just like, dude, that's six years. I mean, that is money. I mean, if you would figure out the solution to this the next day, it would have been like, oh, I've had this problem, got a solution, na, 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 moving on. And he's like, man, and that grit, you know, that's what connects people with what happened to you is that, yes. that frustration. And he's like, you should really relish those six years because that's what gives you the fire now that you have. And well, that is great, great insights from our friend Mark. Yeah. If things are easy, that's really not really there isn't really a story there. It's, the, <laughs> yeah, it's right. the struggle and the grind that happened between the problem and the solution. Right. Um, and so. Um, I'll, I'll just do the talking for you because I know it could be somewhat emotional and you were just, you just about celebrated it, the 10 year anniversary of this thing happening. But, uh, 2010, you're playing a gig in Palm Springs. You're having a great time. You're getting ready to set up. You don't notice there's a plate gra glass window. You walk through it. There's glass, there's blood. It's a disaster. The doctor says you got casts on both your hands, no drums for a year. And then this tension problems start to manifest for about six years. And it seemed like that in 2016, there was a turning point when you took a gig on a cruise ship and you felt like you wanted to learn the language of your nervous system. Whew. That's a lot. Man, a wow. Lot I've never heard somebody speak it back to me like that. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? I know it can be a very, you know, um, tumultuous, um, and traumatic thing uh but this is what led to all this research that you're doing in this whole, whole beautiful chapter of your life where you are a scientifically informed drummer and now a speaker you're a speaker that happens to play the drums and you're a drummer that happens to be able to effectively communicate on a very specific subject so i applaud you for setting yourself up for your next 20 years because this is a youth oriented business and it's always something very smart to have another two, three, four, five irons in the fire. And you're doing that. Yeah. So. What's <laughs> cheers. Yeah. What's coming up for me the next three years. I've never been more excited about anything in my life. It's really a dream come true. Some opportunities that are happening starting. Can you, can you tell 5th. us, can you tell us or no? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll set it up a little bit there. So there's this misconception I've had about something we all understand to be mental toughness. And so, yeah, I mean, you've mentioned motivation earlier and we all think, OK, you have to be mentally tough to be able to accomplish something, to be able to perform at a high level. And there was something that I didn't quite understand about that that I'm working on now is like, what is supporting our mental toughness and it's emotional toughness. I mean, there are things, there's a threshold. It's hard to talk about sometimes, but there is a threshold that we can become emotionally overwhelmed depending on the level of the circumstance. Absolutely. And yeah. And so our emotional toughness needs to supersede the level of challenge of our circumstances. And so it's one thing to think of, yeah, you know, practicing hard and trying to get to the top of the mountain. But what happens when that challenge inevitably inevitably confronts us? Do we have the emotional toughness to overcome that? And so that I don't hear that being spoken enough about. And that's really what I want to approach. So, Cause I think real resilience is 50% looking at the person at the top of the mountain and 50% looking at the person at the bottom of the ocean. How did that person pull themselves up? You know, they're, they're both using the tools of their nervous system to achieve greatness and to bounce back from extreme adversity. And so I, I love Tim Ferriss's take, you know, well, what, what if you did the exact opposite? You know, like, OK, we're looking at these great achievers. You know, what if we looked at the exact opposite of great achievers? And that would be people who are suffering the deepest traumas. You know, what are the tools that those people are being, you know, facilitated? What, how are they pulling themselves up? And so that's really the research that I want to study, which is why I'm super excited to have been a, accepted into the Somatic Experiencing Trauma Healing Practitioner three-year certification and the biggest hero in my life, Betsy Politan, an unbelievable embodiment worker is going to be my 
contact for my case studies and individual sessions and Amazing. Yeah, I just can't wait. I can't. So this wait is not a time. master's degree or a doctorate. This is something outside of the university system, but it's a a training program that's going to take three years. Yeah, yeah. So there are eight different one week trainings in person, and then in between you work with clients, and then while you're working with the clients, you take those that case study work and work individually with a mentor. And to think that I'll get to work individually with Betsy is just too exciting. I mean. Five years ago, when I came to learn about her work, I was like, I want to be the Betsy Pollitton of drumming. And she was at Boston University at the time, but she recently moved to L.A. And so now the timing has worked out for me to study with her. And I can't wait. That is incredible. And see, so for me, I am I am uh, overeducated in the sense that I did seven, at least seven years of higher education. I don't have a desire to go back at all, but you bounced at year three or four and you took, lived your life for 25 years and now you're incredibly excited about something and you're jumping into the deep end of the pool. And so, and then will you make a little money in the process or is this, you're going to have to make your money elsewhere and then this is a labor of love for three years. So for the first year, you are a student. And then for the second two years, you're in training. And so the typical thing is you would do half the hourly you would as a completed practitioner, a somatic yes. experiencing practitioner. They tend to make 150 to 200 a session. And so I would, you know, the first year, I've, it's going to be mostly about building my program, which is going to be a focus on sports psychology. So I really want to look at, especially um, Gabrielle Wolf, he's a sports psychologist, and there's an embodied cognition in sports psychology. MIT has a program, and the big piece of it is rehabilitation. You know, these star athletes, there's inevitably some sort of injury that happens and how that's the big piece. How do they rehabilitate? And so using that new research from the sports medicine realm and bringing it into a trauma a healing paradigm, that's going to be kind of, that's why I really, really like this kind of metaphor, the top of the mountain and the bottom of the ocean, like those same tools you use to get you know, pull yourself up and also get to the top. It's the same nervous system and it's the same tools of resilience. And so that's what I want to be studying. All right. So what um, uh, now I, I have heard you say that resilience is essentially healing in real time. Yeah. Oh, but what is this embodiment that you speak of? What is that exactly? Uh, embodiment is mind body connection. Gotcha. And so for hundreds of years, in particular, since uh, Rene Descartes said, I think, therefore I am, there's been this privileging of the brain over the body. And even to the extent that neuroscience, neuro means nerve, science is the study of the science of nerves, you would think it'd be the whole body, but neuroscience is the brain. And so it's like all this focus has been on the brain and the body has just been considered this kind of meat wagon that hauls the brain around. And now we're understanding how much information starts in the body and that triggers cognition. So uh -huh. the feeling happens in the body first and then the brain reacts. And that's really been tipping the paradigm. Wow. Um, so yeah, I also have heard you mention that Trauma, I love acronyms. You can have it as an acronym, was essentially teaching resilience and understanding mindful awareness. So you are, uh, so again, trauma is teaching resilience and understanding mindful awareness. So this is going to be essentially the, the crux of your work. You're in yeah. the right city for the, for the athlete thing, because let's face it, drummers are athletes. Um, and, you know, you're going to have all the paperwork uh, to back up the fact that, yeah, oh, my God, I'm going to be able to work with all those any of the athletes in these famous sports teams in Los Angeles. And they probably are going to love the fact that you're like, my guy that works with me is actually a kick ass drummer. Have you seen this guy shred on the drums? I mean, you're like a killer, like fusion chops drummer. I mean, you can do the hotel cafe scene and back up singer songwriters and play next to nothing, but you can play the, the drums, man. You know, so I think that's going to be like very exciting for your clients in the future. Thanks. Yeah, actually, you mentioned polyvagal informed drumming. There is this research of the vagus nerve that has been really changing the outlook of a lot of healing modalities. And I mean, the vagus nerve, it 
stems up from all of our internal organs and goes up to our brain and 80 percent of it is sensory information so when we talk about mental toughness like 20 percent is coming from the brain down to our body through this incredibly intricate and highly <laughs> kind of influential nerve system and 80 percent is coming up and so really we need to tune into what that information is and we used to think that it was all nonsense for the longest time because right the brain is the center of the universe but we're, we're seeing how easily this brain is swayed by this thing called affect so affect is pure biological information before it becomes emotion and feeling and so you can you can understand affect by through biometrics and um, neurofeedback, brain waves, heart rate variability, blood oxygen, skin galvanic response, how our pores respond to stress. Wow. And if you remember anything from middle school science class, there's the biology of the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, fight or flight, rest and digest. And we used to think rest and digest uh, was just this thing that was kind of kept us calm. And then fight or flight is really the activation of emotion, but that's not true. There are these two sides to the parasympathetic nervous system that one is really very deeply embedded in healing, uh, health, growth, and restoration. And that's what the vagus nerve does. Interesting. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Because the, uh, am I right in saying that there's something to fight, fight or flight with us as these human animals um, that uh, you like, it almost speaks to in form of like people that are positive or negative as a general rule i feel like people almost have to work so hard to be positive because our first setting is the fight or flight whereas cavemen we would be like woolly mammoth saber-toothed tiger run and then 24 hours a day we're on high alert to not end up being a meal right so that's kind of ingrained in our dna yeah it is but i would suggest that the Neanderthal or more ancient humans, they had better access to p their parasympathetic nervous, the non fight or flight attributes that we all have been endowed with. I believe they could sink into that much easier than we can now in modern world. Why? I think, I think media tends to, because we had no, the Neanderthal had no idea what was happening outside of his field of vision. And so, and it did, wasn't worried about his bank account. It wasn't worried about anything. He wasn't you know, about comparison, than, comparing himself to some other person on Instagram. Well, yeah. they're doing a huge recording session today at Capitol Records. I'm just practicing paradiddles. <laughs> You know what I mean? I remember, I remember playing Bruce's Steakhouse with my cumbia band, and I was like, I wonder what Keith Carlock's doing right now, and looked up his itinerary. He's like, oh, he's at Royal Festival Hall tonight. <laughs> he's at playing the Royal Albert Hall. <laughs> Albert, oh, right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, okay, I'm going to play my Bruce's Steakhouse gig. Yeah. That, does, Keith, yeah, does Keith know um, what an influence he was on you? Uh, I've talked to him a few times. He's he's a bit aloof of a guy. I mean, he's a monster drummer, biggest, greatest respect for him ever, but I'm sure he has people tell him what an influence he is all the time. So He is, he is hard yeah. to get a hold of. He lives cup, uh, 20 minutes from me, and uh, we never run into each other, you know? <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. You know? But, uh, okay, so you feel like early man had, was more tapped into that. Um you know, we never discuss this, uh, but you know, this, the, the trauma and there's something, yeah, yeah. Trauma. We talked about the acronym, um, you know, when our band was in Vegas and we ran for our lives at that festival, um, there's really nothing but gratitude in our organization because there's 60 people that are completely healthy that were seemingly unaffected by that event, yet there's 58 people that are dead. There's 546 people that are injured. Their lives are changed forever. They're in wheelchairs. They're disabled. Horrible. It's a horrible day in human history. We just ran. And I'm sure that there is some sort of lasting effects of PTSD. And I'm a very positive person, but there's probably things that I'm carrying around with me that I don't notice. Is that a possibility like for the guys, for me and the guys in my band that were like, we're fine. You know what I mean? They're, they're like, maybe yeah. you should talk to some. I went and talked to somebody. I had two or three sessions where I talked to somebody. I figured like this is smart to do while it's fresh. Go, go talk to somebody. And, you know, maybe there's a couple of 
guys in my band that didn't because we as men are like, be tough, man. You know what I mean? But maybe that's not the way, the best way to handle things. Yeah. Well, I mean, psychotherapy, talk therapy has shown to be effective in healing folks. And I would say that's you brought the affected. Like, what does it mean to be affected? Well, in Western culture, that would be some clearly observable sign. And so, well, okay, well, let's let's talk about this affect. What is affect? What's going on in our body that's unobservable? Yeah. And so it would have been a more traditional view of it. Well, if you can't observe it, why bother? You know, if it's not something that's immediately, you know, it's something like truth is purely cerebral and like unconscious. It's like mucky muck, you know, that, that's kind of this, uh, what Rene Descartes would say. And that's been the paradigm that's been follow that our education systems, politics, everything kind of follows that. But this, this thing of affect, this going, that's what's going in on our body. There's a, there's kind of a metaphor I've been teasing out that I think drummers would get especially recording drummers because so okay i have some drums here i do online tracks i have like 12 microphones there's all these signals coming from these microphones and they're going through my interface and preamps and going into pro tools right. okay well that's so that's signal flow and so what's going on in this signal you know there's also some noise there's a level of noise in every signal there's the noise floor there's the signal to noise ratio and so you might not hear the noise when you first bring it up in pro tools but when you slap a compressor on it you know something that lowers the highs and brings up the lows oh when you bring up those lows suddenly like whoa there's I mean, this noise I mean, it was there. like a hum yeah yeah, and it's like that wasn't there before. And so an inexperienced engineer would say, oh, well, my compressor's broken. The compressor is the issue. And an experienced engineer would be like, oh, okay, we found the noise floor that was in this signal. And so affect is kind of like this noise floor, this thing that is coming up in our sensory information. And we didn't, we weren't quite aware of it until this external compressor kind of caused some compression in our lives and suddenly this this tension came up and then we then we were aware of it and so we think externally we think the compressor the external circumstance did this but it was really in us all along because it's kind of the sad state of affairs we're only consciously aware of 0. 0.0004 percent of all the sensory information in our body that's all we can actually consciously be aware of one two thousand five hundredth Wait a so minute, wait a minute. We're we're only we're only conscious of that small amount of information, informational awareness in our environment, or you're saying in our body? Both. So anything that's external, anything of the six senses that we're taking in from our externally, and then all the internal information, all of the reflexes, all, all the kind of wisdom in our stomach and our heart and our lungs, all this is coming up to the brain stem, and then it gets routed into the midbrain, the limbic brain, and then these brain, these parts of the brain decide what the cortex, the conscious brain should be aware of. Yeah. And so this noise floor is always there. But it, uh, we only become aware of it when it gets triggered by a compression, by some sort of stress in our environment. And so when we dig into affect, when we really start kind of sussing out what I'd like to think of the SEO, like you have 2,500 search, you know, <laughs> kind of things come up in a search and you can only see the top one, like your SEO better be badass. And so I like to reterm the SEO as sensory evaluation organization. <laughs> like you kind of have to reorganize, like what do I really need to know about these 2,500 pieces of sensory information which is most vital to me and so exploring that is a deep exploration that i'm just beginning to scratch the surface on and i start noticing things in other people now that i understand neurology better and all these kind of natural reflexes and when you start noticing unnatural reflexes in people you know that that's some emotion that is imprinted in their nervous system like you mean like someone device. being snappy or grouchy or um uh it just having rage. Yeah, a uh, functional expression of stress, I would say. So, I mean, stress happens to everybody. Yeah. And so we're having a response that will elevate our kind of our, I guess our, some, our body's bank account, kind of like how we're allocating the money, the resources of our affect. Like, are we using our money well, or do we have these subscriptions that are kind of taxing us that aren't 
doing as well. And so I start noticing things. Wow, you're kind of burning this energy that isn't functional for you. It's not serving you. And there's these, and that's really kind of the essence of somatic experiencing. You start noticing these unnatural reflex patterns, these unconscious reactions, and you make the make the pay the client aware of them. And are is the client able to desist? Like, is it because we should only be doing what we intend? Right. And so if we're doing something unintentional that's taxing our biological resources, our money, let's say our affect is our body's money. <laughs> and so yeah. how we're using our body's money should be, you know, we should be using it wisely. And when you see somebody spending it unwisely, I want to help that person. And I'm starting to become more tuned in to how to be a witness like that. Awesome. And now, so you've been studying all this this is probably you're on what year four or five of this deep research? Uh, seventeen. So yeah, about seven years. It was it was pretty clumsy at first. Uh, a lot of it was just an embodiment podcast and just realizing there was this entire world of practitioners out there helping people to kind of use less of their body's money inefficient inefficiently. Yes. And I was like, wow, that's valuable. Helping people to not waste their bodies resources. Mm -hmm. And so then I, I started learning polyvagal theory and somatic experiencing. And finally, I got certified in polyvagal theory. A few years ago, I've been mentoring with the Polyvagal Institute. And it was mostly with sports folks. Uh, the first cohort I was in, it was people working with athletes in the World Cup. And so this fight or flight is interesting because right before you get to fight or flight is where you want to be as an athlete. So once you go into fight or flight and you're activating the sympathetic nervous system, you are burning your fuel inefficiently because it's meant to be a short burn. Like we were meant to get into fight and that fight should be over in minutes. But if like for the duration of a entire event, if you're stuck there by the time you get to the fourth quarter, you're, you know that you're depleted more than you need to. And so these trainers I was working with, they help athletes to understand, okay, what am I burning inefficiently? How do I tuck in just below? I get it to activate the sympathetic nervous system. And so how can I still be at peak performance and not burn my resources excessively? And so then, so that's kind of the performance angle of that, that sports psychology, embodied cognition, and the trauma angle is how can I not burn my resources inefficiently when I'm trying to heal? How can I focus my energy on resilience and kind of coming back from adversity? Yeah. So, and so it's all through the eyes of a drummer, which is incredible. You saw something that was first a, you were looking for practical solutions to your particular problem. You fell in love with the subject. And along the way, you said, oh my God, there's so many commonalities between this and drumming. And you're like, oh my God, I could be one of the, you know, it's it, there's not a lot of guys in your lane. So you are going to be the torchbearer of something very, very special. Let me ask you this. Now that you're learning more about psychology, biology, um, uh, all uh, all that stuff, uh, the scientific mind, when you sit down to play your drums and you just want to land into a, um, are you overthinking things scientifically or is it assisting your pursuit as a, mus a musician that plays the drums? That's my favorite thing about it is that I love playing so much more because it feels better because I really understand these ways to find what my affect levels are. How is my body functioning away from the drums? And so I started a range of motion is important for this, the relationship between breath and heart rate. There's a really crucial piece. Like, I mean, if you take your finger and put it against your jugular, you can feel your heartbeat. And so I'd like try to tap your heels on the ground along with your heartbeat. And this is exteroception, external perception. You're feeling your heartbeat. And the big piece is to be able to pull your fingers away and still feel your heartbeat and tap your th heels. 
Wow. So that's interoception. That's being being able to feel your heartbeat inside you, which is really the cue for your emotional state. And once you can do that, and you can tell, wow, okay, I'm checking out my heart rate right now, which uh, probably like one in about 30 people roughly can have that level of interoception where they can just focus attention to their heart and know the pulse and be able to use that as their metronome. Mm -hmm. And so that's something I've been working on with breath work. And so when I bring that to the drums now, I realize, oh, there are kind of these seven default things that happen physiologically in my body that are a cue that I'm kind of going into fight or flight and so wow. I just like I'm playing something simple okay where's my heel where's my shoulder are my shoulders up are they forward what's my heart rate was face is a huge the brain face connection is very intense it's how it's a broadcasting emotional state the vagus nerve that goes along well Expressions of the vagus nerve go along our eyes and along our mouth, pharyng laryngeal, pharyngeal, and then the ear is actually interesting. It's uh, the vestibulocochlear nerve. It's balance and hearing are in the same channel. And so what we hear affects our balance. And so, Whoa. yeah, and so a loud noise is going to bring our heels up. And so anytime we get past a certain dynamic level, it might trigger a kind of orienting reflex. We need to be as particularly sure, okay, where are my heels? How, what's the separation between how I'm using my thigh muscle and my calf muscle, my lower abdominals and well, sphincter. <laughs> it's a very important hey, muscle. Tighten that and, sphincter for the man, tight it groove, is such man. An, man, if you can uh, tight, uh, compress all the air out of your lungs with your lower abdominal and still be, make sure that your pelvic floor is the more polite term for it. But if that's relaxed and you can differentiate tension in these kind of muscle groups that are close to each other, that is really important in somatic work. Wow. So what would be the definition of the, of, of the polyvagal theory and somatic drumming? The, oh, the definition of it? Yeah. Um, augmenting your resources, really maximizing how you use your body and find, you know, finding cues that are indications that you're in a physiological state that's not appropriate for your conditions. I mean, wow. sometimes there is going to be a time where you need to activate and, you know, you need to run or you need to fight. But uh, the stage fright is a big one for a lot of us. Like I think an imposter syndrome, there's like this trigger from the body that it goes into fight or flight. And by the time it goes through our brainstem, our reticular activation system, the midbrain, it gets to the cortex, the conscious expression of a feeling of fight or flight is that I don't belong where I am. And the brain often translates that as I don't belong here. I'm inferior. It's an inferiority complex. Did you, did, so, like, you did you ever struggle with that in during your journey in Los Angeles? Yeah. I mean, I always saw myself as the low rent Keith Carlock and there was a lot of truth to that. I mean, I would have taken any of his scraps, right? You know, <laughs> like on a purely like, objective level, it kind of suited me. I mean, I didn't think I'd ever be as, I mean, that guy, man. Oh my God, dude. First time but, I but heard you him. know, musicians like that come along like once every 20 years or so. Like, it's, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's like, yeah. you can't really compare, like when I had to go sub for Keith with the Dallas Brass and Electric, it's like, well, look at, it, I'm going to, I can only do me because there's yeah. only one me and there's only yeah. one him, but that, that embracing that is comes with maturity. Yeah. And presence, like they're really how to deal and dive into what is our physiological affect. What's happening biologically is to be present. And once you're present, you don't care about anything that's happening except the here and now this particular millisecond from one to the next and then yeah. at that point it doesn't matter who is doing what external to being present in your task at hand and so that's what's made me love drumming so much more now is because i feel like there's this really connection with the present and I, that can get muddled i know some folks say, oh, I'm bad at meditating. And like meditating isn't clearing your mind. It's hyper focusing on the activity of your body. Like if you don't have a breath practice, if you're not trying to like flex different parts of your muscles without flexing others, that's really challenging. Like mm. trying to, I've noticed like, okay, your heel and your calf and your thigh and your pelvic floor like try to like cycle through those muscles and do it slowly and then speed it up and once you can start really differentiating them then when you sit at the drums you start noticing oh i just triggered my calf muscle that didn't benefit me at all that's an indication that i'm overusing my my money <laughs> my bio money <laughs> yeah now you mentioned the uh 
one of the expressions of the vagus nerve would be in the the face. So someone like me that is known to have the worst drumming cum faces, uh, these are these are they're the worst drumming faces. I'm jealous of you because you don't make crazy faces when you play. I'm getting better at it. It's it's all about whether it's intentional or habitual. So my, my, our, mine is not intentional. I would rather not do it, but it's just drum face. It's it's like I'm feeling the 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 subdivisions and the quarter note and the pocket or whatever that thing is. The muse is on my shoulders, and I'm going to that special place. And so I'm not really controlling what I'm doing with my face. It's just happening. And and no, and I get a lot of shit for it. John, no one gives John Mayer shit. Have you seen the faces he's makes? Is it just because he's the front guy? Just because he plays the root to toot to toot to toot to guitar? I mean, so what's the deal with drum face? What is that? Uh, well, it's if it's intentional. If you are commanding the use of the muscles in your face, then it's good. Yeah. And if you're not, it's 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 worth exploring yeah and so you, i explore it with myo tape so this is sleepers tape and so i would take a piece of it and i would peel it off and i put one piece here because mm -hmm. this is where the nerve for the i mean that kind of controls around the eyes that's, that's the that, that that's where the botox people are going to take your money right up there yeah <laughs> well if you if you do this practice then you don't need to because the I, tape will help <laughs> yeah so the tape will the tape will clue you into when you're activating these muscles involuntarily and so then the and then you take another piece of it and you put it over your mouth and so if your mouth and and if you're able to maintain composure and not move these muscles in your face then you are in intention so that's I, I practice with tape on my face and anything that I do that triggers an involuntary activation of these muscles, then I go back and I practice it until I can remove that and just make sure that what I'm doing is intentional because it's because our emotional overwhelm resides in our tension habits. I mean, our nervous system is a recording device. It records what happens to us throughout our lives. And if something happens that's overwhelming, it's in our nervous system. And just because we're not conscious of it doesn't mean it's not there. And so we can kind of, it's kind of like ghost chasing. Like we have these ghosts that are in our nervous system and you kind of have to figure out the right filter to find out the paranormal activity. And so I kind of look at myself as ghost chasing, you know, these residual kind of memories in my physiology and I've, after years of doing it with myself I'm now able to see it in my clients and I've, that's what I'm really excited about the program with somatic experiencing is that's the whole thing to see people's ghosts how they live in their bodies fantastic man I'm so excited about your your future um, and I'm sure this is a no-brainer and it'll be pretty easy to do since you have literally no competition in the space and you're such an effective communicator and you got such a great smile um, <laughs> You're going to do the Percussive Art Society. Basic, right? Please tell me. I, I applied. We'll see. It's still a fringe. I mean, like people, it hasn't filtered into mainstream media like what exactly the new mind body science is. There's still some residual idea that it's frou frou new age. Well, BS it's, and, it wouldn't be for the big room 500, you know, where the 2000 people sit because it's just not there as, as, because it's scientific. It's not like Mike Mangini, I'm going to play every <laughs> note. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it's going to be one of the smaller rooms that you'll pack. And it'll be so interesting, and it'll be one of the top talks of the of the convention. I guarantee it. We just need to make it happen. I know, people, we could make this make this thing happen. But I think that would be really, really widely received. And now, tell me about this. You have another acronym. You and I with these acronyms. Hello, I love it. <laughs> Either love them or you hate them. But you got one called Grace, Grounding, Relaxation, Awareness, Centering, and Energy. Tell us about Grace. Yeah, then... The next level of it is synergy. It's kind of one that I've added a bit. So the graces. And I have to admit, it comes from Esalen Institute. I've done a bunch of trainings there. I really admired their program and saw a lot of use out of it. And so it really kind of stacks up kind of like the defaults of, okay, let's, let's, let's first just get to a place where we're even comfortably knowing that we're not going to face plant like I mean, before we run out of air we could kill ourselves by falling backwards and cracking our head on the cement right oh, so ouch. our nervous systems a number one job is do not face plant and die 
<laughs> and so the very first thing that's going to give composure to our nervous system is just feet on the floor, balls of the feet, heels, flat, and having kind of this, if we're sitting as we are, it would be this tripod between our kind of well, <laughs> sphincter muscle and our feet. And so it's this balance there and make, and then first like kind of shift the pelvis forward and backward and find out where neutral is there. Kind of shift the shoulders forward and backward and find out where neutral is there. And then bring the head forward and backward and find out where neutral is there. And so neutral is this balanced point where we're expending as little energy as possible just to be relaxed. So that's that's basic grounding. And then there's an orienting reflex, which is just, okay, there's no arrows flying at my head right now. You know, just kind of looking around the room, making sure that I'm not going to die in the next five minutes with what I can see in my visual environment. That's kind of the nature of grounding. And so there's, a, in fact, EMDRI movement desensitization reprocessing, which is it works with the orientation reflex and really has shown how important it is just to be aware of what's in our immediate environment. And so the grounding and relaxation is like kind of like I've mentioned before, really differentiating our understanding of how we use different muscles. And if you stack that on top of balance, then it gets quickly into martial arts. I do a lot of work with bow staff, Japanese fighting staff, which re you really find out how your joints work, how right side compares with left side balance. Awareness is the rela relationship between breath and heart. Inhale, the heart rate goes up. Exhale, the heart rate goes down. That's, man, that's years of study. <laughs> and centering is that it kind of get deeper into, okay, I'm doing this on my left. Can I do it equally on my right? In a martial arts, this would be called flow, being able to go from right to left equally well. It, you are much better off being able to do simple things equally on both sides than to be able to do a hundred things only on one side. And that has everything to do with brain lateralization, how we use the corpus callosum, and then obviously drumming, the applications are endless. So leading then, with the eighth notes on the across hi-hat or then playing with the eighth notes with the left hand lead like a sloppy rock beat. Like that was like that's simple. Yeah, I would say just both hands playing together. So both hands playing together and being able to do that. And then moving them both to hi hat, and okay. then just being able to bring e each hand equally over to the snare. Yes. Like just being able to do that. And I've had some clients; they they're very uncomfortable doing this. And suddenly, like this starts flaming. And they start adding eighth, eighth notes in the left foot, and then all of a sudden, this unison between the three limbs starts flaming. And that's that's a evidence of some dysregulation in the nervous system. What well, you're intending me, well, to do? But Adam, let me ask you this: When you say clients, are you talking about? People that have been playing the drums that are having trouble doing that, or you use the drum set for non-drummers as a both. form of okay. Yeah, so both in workshops, I do very basic coordination patterns. There are some systems in polyvagal theory that apply very well to coordination patterns between top to bottom, left to right, and then cross coordination: right hand, left foot, left hand, right foot. Oh. And so, and then for drum set clients, there's there's some that just want to. They saw me play a lick, they want to learn it. You know, <laughs> I'll do that. But uh, the ones I'm really interested in are ones who are experiencing injury, emotional overwhelm, aging, uh, losing your identity as a drummer. That's a huge nervous system trigger. For Wait a us. minute. I, so you're dealing with uh, some clients come in. They're professional drummers for 40 years. They're they're facing ageism. Yeah, well, uh, ageism is kind of, well, aging, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're getting older and they can't do things that they used to do. Oh, and I they, see. And they see that, okay, in the next few years, it's just going to get worse and worse. And there's very many of them just, just breathing is an issue. There's so much ignorance about breathing. And I'd, some people say, oh, well, I take deep breaths. I'm fine. And it's like, man, we all need to understand that if we stop breathing, we lose oxygen to our brain. And if we hyperventilate, we're losing oxygen to our brain. So it's, there's such ignorance about this. So, I mean, if we are, if we breathe too much and we pass out, it's not because we over oxygenated our brain, it's because we under oxygenated it. And that's not very intuitive. And so we really need to understand as a culture what the Bohr effect is. Please look it up, B-O-H-R. It's how our blood transmits oxygen to our tissues. And there's this state where if there's not enough oxygen in our blood at all, there's we don't get oxygen to the, our body. And if there's too much oxygen in the blood, then the pH doesn't release 
oxygen into our tissues. And so there's this very fine gradient that we all need to learn about in ourselves. That's a huge part of affect is really understanding how, what level of oxygen do we need? Because roughly 80% of us over breathe and it's very detrimental to us. It's a lot of loss of fingertip sensitivity happens without over breathing. Uh, there's a breath by James Nestor is a brilliant book, very well written, dives deeply into this subject. I would recommend it to everybody. It's kind of the baseline of understanding what affect is because oxygen is such an important what's uh, james uh, nestor's book oh called breath ah breath now there's a yeah. couple other pivotal uh tomes that were mentioned on your website books that you have pictures of in your blog oh oh yeah there are wow there are a lot yeah uh, betsy politan's books are amazing yeah yep. hugh manuel and the actor's secret uh it's a uh, the yes. same tools that actors use are very applicable to drummers uh there are some oh, that are, the body keeps the score that is a great introduction introduction to somatic healing yeah that's ah. kind of somatics 101 the it's it's great and I don't he want does to talk spend about a lot it. of yeah i don't oh oh yeah that's whew, yeah that one opened my eyes yeah there's stuff it's funny because all we're talking about is sensation like all of this work somatic work affect it's all digging deep into what our body is telling us and like you brought it up men are kind of told well no macho means not feeling it's being focused mind over matter smash things with my mind vice you know and sort of erasing this connection with feeling when that's actually creates the greatest weakness we can ever have it opens us to disease and lack of creativity and oh. it's yeah so masculinity is i don't it gets a little kind of into this nebulous thing with wokeness and i, I hate that because i mean i just want to get people to feel better like right. i don't want to go down this rabbit hole of what politics of it i just want my clients to feel better when they play drums but and so but masculinity is often a barrier to that wow interesting how this is all cross-pollinating now is it seems like your work is started it is cross-pollinating with a lot of some of this some of the stuff that uh, dave elich teaches are you guys in conversation do you guys talk about this because there's you know he's going deep you're going deep are, are you getting some of each other's students are you throwing students to each other are you guys going to do a big event at the sunset guitar center am i crazy <laughs> Uh, I completely respect what he does, and he's a monster drummer, yeah. and he is very much into applying Alexander technique, and Alexander I've, I watch everything he puts out, and actually Bots, Betsy Politan it uses a fusion of Alexander technique and somatic experiencing, and so I want to use more sports psychology, this idea of climbing the mountaintop and pulling ourselves up from the bottom of the ocean being the same tools, yeah. and so I mean he's already doing that with Alexander technique, I mean I would love to work with him, we've, I've sent some emails, we've kind of responded a little bit, I'm, I, I'd want to get a little further along. His thing is so well defined yeah. i feel like i need a little more definition before i well you know, kind of hey man you're right it. around the corner tell us about this tedx man you know it's like this is on my to-do list i did not want to do it during covid where it was going to be virtual i want to stand on the red dot yeah. i want to do the thing you knocked it out of the ballpark it was informative it was free flowing it was well executed there was nice. comedy you know, you got to have some comedic moments to break up the seriousness. There is practical application stuff. Um, it had to be well received. Yes, you did it in, in Mississippi. Yeah, it went really well. Anyone interested in doing a TEDx, there's the TED Fellows program that has 16 questions that has you really suss out your topic. And I think that it took me two months to answer those questions it's it's they're all very similar but they all make you kind of tear things apart into different categories and so anyone who uh, that my application is online adamgust.com forward slash ted talk and so that was actually the web page i designed for my ted application and That's i smart. applied applied to one place and i made it to the final round and then i applied to the second place and i was selected in the first round so i, I did something right in my application and so. And it's all there and it's preserved forever and ever and ever. Yeah, and I figured I'd leave it up. Yeah. I mean, some people, other folks that have done one, uh, Jojo Mare, I think, has done one or two. Mike Johnson has done one. Um, our friend here, 
Um, in Nashville, Harry Myrie has done one. Oh, yeah? So there has been about four or five drummers that have done the done the TED Talks, and um, I would like I'd like to be next. I've it's pretty much written. I guy hired a coach during COVID, and we had about six or seven sessions to write the thing. Um, but the big thing is the application process and nailing that application process. So, um. I guess that's what's. I guess that's on the to do list. <laughs> yeah, make a you know? website for it. Yeah, just take those sixteen questions from the fellows program and answer them. And that's like pretty much any TED or TEDx organization is going to only ask a few of those questions. And if they see that you went above and beyond that, they're going to be oh, well, this this is ready to go. Kind of. So literally, build a website that just exists you know, just free flowing for anyone to find and then direct those individuals to that site. Yeah. So in the TEDx application, just answer, take, draw from what you've already written into the application and then put the TED, then the website, the URL that you composed. Yeah. And that'll immediately put you above, like probably you'll be in the top 3% already just having done that. That's incredible. Of applicants. I'll have to do that, man. This is also so exciting. Um, I wanted to spend a lot of time talking about all this research and where you are, you know, with your career. This is very, uh, it's, it's evolutionary. You're evolving. Um, but I don't want to miss out on any fun, interesting, uh, heartfelt stories about your early days in Los Angeles. Uh, did you park cars? Did you have day jobs? Did you max out credit cards and eat ramen noodle? Um, <laughs> Were there takeaways? I mean, I saw you in like 2016, I believe, if not 17, somewhere around there, playing with Paul Vallis, which is this incredible blues band. And you were killing it. And I, I think I got up and played two or three songs. Uh, hopefully it was all right. Yeah, but it was a, great. It was a benefit for my acting coach's wife. And we all ended up at this crazy little club right in the heart of Hollywood. Um, but yeah, am I missing anything? Or are there some takeaways that you would want to like some kid that's growing up in Fargo and he's about to graduate high school and he wants to move to LA and be a professional drummer? What do you tell the kid? Yeah, there was the best advice I ever got was your feel starts when you walk in the door. And that was something I really did not understand. I always thought your feel was when you counted the tune off and started playing. But the minute you walk in and look around the room, your feel is starting. And your So a vibe and energy. Yeah. And it's, I mean, that's essentially, it's funny now that I remember hearing that from Joel Taylor. Now I think about, well, that's everything about affect. You're broadcasting what unconsciously what's happening in your body and people can pick up on that particularly people who've been out here a long time and they probably can just resonate and yeah a vibe you can call it that an aura or a, you can even call it your biosphere this magnetic field that we all put out that's about 10 feet away from us this isn't controversial this isn't some woo, -woo idea it's been researched there we have a magnetic field and yes. we are broadcasting our physiological state and other people feel that whether they're conscious of it or not. And the more conscious we are of it, the better we off we are. Our feel is that. And, you know, so, yeah. Interesting. I mean, so when, when did Joel Taylor tell you that? Uh, at Lave Lee, watching Joey Heredia play with Marco Mendoza. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that band was fun to watch. And I so this had like, to be back way like... Uh, yeah, this was like 2002. I'd been out here a while. Like, man, I've been out here a few years, you know, and I'm, you know, I hadn't had a good session yet. I hadn't toured. And I think even he thought I needed a good... <laughs> I think he could kind of vibe for me that I needed this information. He was like, dude, that's amazing. You're, yeah, your feel starts when you walk in the door. So I remember driving home just like, oh, fuck. That's, that, that's pretty <laughs> profound. Now, Joel Taylor, um, incredible drummer that can cover all sorts of styles for the listeners that don't know. Um, I started hearing his name in the Dallas top 40 scene because Dave Barnett from Random Access was pals with Joel Taylor. So Joel, I for the listeners, was this cat that when um, what was that game? guitar a guitar hero he did yeah. all the recreation sound alikes yeah yeah that was all a those songs yeah. so so 
it was pro- hopefully it was a big paycheck, but I do know it was probably just one time because no one gives residuals to anyone. But so say they had to re-record ba- Bob O'Reilly, he had to go research and find out who what the drum set was, what the make was, what the sizes were, and then transcribe those performances note for note and then recreate them. So you know you got to be a great drummer to go from like, okay, I'm doing Charlie Watts, I'm doing Keith Moon, I'm doing Phil Rudd, I'm doing a, and doing a great job of it and playing period instruments or modern instruments yeah. made to sound like period instruments. Yeah, Blair Sinto would be a great one for that. Yeah. Totally, because Blair can get the sound. Yeah, you he want- would find out like what preamp they were using on the overheads. <laughs> yeah. yeah, which is really funny because um, I love Blair. And when I have to record in L.A., I go to his place. And it's so fun because it's a drummer producing a drummer. And it's just such a great time. Um, but I am not that guy. I don't want to obsess about a preamp. I just don't. You know what I mean? So, But it does take two. It takes a lot to make the world go around different types of folks. <laughs> So, yeah. so that's what you would tell a kid. And then what, did you have any day jobs or interesting fun stories, uh, in the early days? Uh, American movie classics. I did catering. So yeah. Yeah. So I was the catering person and it was always fun. Whoopi Goldberg was real nice. Lawrence Fishburne was real nice. And there are Lauren Bacall was a bitch and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, I don't know. It was interesting to see like how much the person who was being focused on how much their vibe trickled down to everybody. Like, I mean, when Whoopi did her thing, like everybody was in a good mood. The day went by like that. And if it was somebody who was not fun, it's just like, oh God, is it lunch yet? So American movie classics in the sense that a a, a classic film would be shown and then a star would come in and do the interstitials. Like this, this movie came out in such and such. And so when you say catering, you're not talking about craft services. You're talking about you would bring the lunch in and, and, and yeah, set it up yeah and, i was gotcha. serving food for them yeah doing those intermediary or those intermittent pieces yeah so they would film those and for whatever reason i got on those yeah i was doing that quite a bit food was good paid okay flexible hours oh yeah you got the i mean some people give and you know, they live and die by that craft service table man when the starving artist days <laughs> you load your pockets up with that craft service tupperware table. baby yeah i <laughs> had a backpack with tupperware in it yeah <laughs> Now, is outside of the Red Elvises and just being a freelancer, am I missing some of your resume, some folks that you've worked with in the hotel cafe scene or recording sessions or little tours? You Did I did I did I miss things along the way? Uh, well, I mean, select tracks I was proud of. I did like, man, hundreds of pieces for TV and film. I mean, they were such a shotgun blast of tracks. I don't even know what made it where, I think. <laughs> but yeah, Stuart Hart, he was hiring me a lot on the West Side. And so that was always a regular, I don't know, TV and film music. It feels yeah. good to be working on that. I'm sure there are lots of drummers that would have liked that gig. But I mean, mostly like, I don't know, I love the gigs I do. Like, yeah. I mean, it's tomorrow, the Roman Palacios, this great crooner, Frank Sinatra style singer and Rodeo Drive. And then I'm doing this burlesque show with really great band, high end dancers, and then leaving town with Lori Morvan and she's great to play with. And so, I mean, not, not people you'd hear with, but I mean, really a, eclectic calendar and everyone, I kind of a prerequisite that it's a cool gig for me. I don't have, I, I can't deal with being treated like a cog. So, I mean, maybe that has, hurt me in some ways but in other ways i love all the gigs that i do so that's nice so what you're saying you don't like being treated like a cog in the wheel uh well i mean you know the cattle call auditions ah, just, gotcha so we need a drummer we'll take anybody I, I typically get hired for what i do and i and that means that okay we're gonna we i'm gonna walk in and i'm gonna play a way that they anticipated and yes. so i it's not like fulfilling a role and i mean it, so it's jazz burlesque blues i do rock stuff and, and then of course the online tracks there's always something different and so yeah I, I really enjoy the gigs i do but yeah i'm definitely i mean compared to you or probably most of the drummers you've had on your podcast i don't no, have a resume dude you live a- in sunny california southern california for all these years since the year 2000 it's pretty incredible and there's been some hardships and some ups and downs but you're a survivor you're a thriver and you're a drummer that can read 
play with a click and play any style. So you are always going to work. You know, they, we know, you know, we're mutual, our mutual friend, Stuart Jean there, the great all around drummer was, you know, at oh, musicians man. too. Do you do any yeah. of that West coast? Uh, you know, those, those variety bands that he does. Uh, I was in one group that would do like cocktail hour. Leah Zeger, man, unbelievable musician, man. I should call her. We shut down over COVID, but she was one of my favorite people to work with ever. Unbelievable singer, virtuoso violinist, sweetest person in the planet. We do this French jazz thing. We'd go in for the, you know, kind of cocktail hour and then split. It was the coolest gig. <laughs> wow. So yeah, yeah, a bunch of stuff, agency work. Yeah, I do some subbing for that too. So yeah, Roman gets a lot of that stuff. It's just trio, so it pays really well for him. So yeah, nice man. It's so exciting to be doing all those things, which means you have to drive an SUV because if you're doing all that schlepping around there, you got to have some. It's right. It's you got to have the SUV. Um, let's see what else? Did I forget anything about your national your uh, your Los Angeles journey? You're busy, man. You the did journey. it. Journey. Yeah, it's been a roller coaster, but I've, I'm really excited that I found something that is separate from drumming, but not. You know, something that still, I mean, everything that I'm going to be working on is with drummers as clients and it's stuff that I'll be using to benefit myself. I mean, all it's basically the clinical application of affect regulation. That's kind of what I'm working on. And the more I can understand it in myself, the more I can bring to my clients and the better, more fun I have playing. It just feels amazing when I'm using just as much effort as necessary to get what I want out of the drums and then to feel like I'm at that point and be able to recognize other folks that aren't there. And I really want to help people to find that because it's such an emotional journey. It's such a window into people's souls. And that's why, man, Betsy Pollitt, and I've seen some workshops with her, like her recognizing a person's personal story in their movement is mind blowing. It's like, if I could even touch what she's able to do at all, I'm like, I, would be blessed <laughs> it is supernatural what she's capable of i'm so excited and you're going to be working with her for three years right there yeah that's so 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 cool man listen we're going to end up with the fast the fast favorite five so i'll ask oh, you okay. five questions and, oh, you man. know and i we usually like to try to make it uh fast but it never is um favorite <laughs> color purple <laughs> i see that because you have purple oralex and purple curtains in your drum room i love it man you know i have a friend i have a student sarah cardiel we call her the real deal sarah cardiel she's in yeah. connecticut and she loves purple she has got purple drums she's got purple clothes purple hair i love it favorite food or favorite dish tacos you got to love it you know it's so funny we got taco trucks here in nashville but i i don't know which ones are good i don't know if i could trust them in la you could just eat at any taco truck and it's gonna be fantastic Probably, yeah. The type of meat they use is important. Man, if you're ever northeast side, you got to go to Via's Tacos. It's the only Michelin rated tacos in LA. It's unbelievable. Now, when you say, are you say like the Pasadena area? Uh, yeah, it's on uh, Figaro and 52 Via. Oh, it's also in Grand Central Market. They're just expanded. Yeah, it's blowing up. Their stuff is Via's. so amazing. Okay. You know where I always end up at, you know, Cactus Taqueria number one or number two yeah. or number three? <laughs> that's a it's staple good. for And then at home. Man, my my tacos are pretty damn good. I am Ch Chicana approved. My girl loves. It. Yeah, <laughs> you, like, now okay. you've been you've been dating your Chicana for years, yeah. Yeah, seven. Yep. Ooh, nice. Yeah, and white boy I, can make some tacos according to her. So I love that. How about um, your favorite drink? Favorite drink? Uh, alcohol? Any any drink whatsoever? I mean, it, if we want to be exciting, we can have alcohol in it. You know. Yeah, uh, man, reverse osmosis water. I recently got one of yeah one of those super filtration systems for water, and man, it's unbelievable. And then you know the carbon carbonated. I love the the agua Russia <laughs> agua de gasm is in what you say in Russia. But what do I? Water. You say like water with bubbles, like a bu yeah buble. Yeah, I like it. Um, now, this is difficult for some people, but something that just keeps rearing its ugly head in your life, it comes on the radio. You are going to crank this sucker up. Your favorite song. My favorite song. Anything by John Mayer. Body is a Wonderland. I don't know. That first album of his, Room for Squares, I. it's so well done, perfectly mixed. I admire the masterful job that was done from beginning to end on that album. And it so, is yeah, a little, kind of a 
guilty pleasure. That is a masterpiece, and it's so funny that I brought up John Mayer today. Um, have you ever met Near Z, the drummer that played on that record? No, I listened to your podcast with him, oh. though. He's a monster. Yeah, his drumming is flawless on there. Yeah, Jason Mraz album. I remember, like, who is this drummer? It's like, oh, yeah. right. He, the remedy, <laughs> that remedy stuff. Woo! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so good. Okay, well, that's great. You'll meet Near. He's nice. Um, and uh, your favorite movie, man. Favorite movie. Favorite movie um inception Ooh, that's heavy yeah it's really kind of explains these layers of polyvagal theory in a deep way and that's why i like it so much so wow. yeah these kind of tiered this hierarchy of our emotional responses is very well represented in sort of these dream states of the movie so christopher nolan's not messing around you have got to pay attention yeah yeah it's, I, I even liked it better the second time yeah yeah no it's it's repeated viewing that is not a beavis and butthead movie man you got you definitely have to pay attention to that adamgus.com amazing resource you listeners out there be sure to check out his tedx talk you could see it i believe on your website but of course youtube it's called the science of the groove and it is yeah. fantastic man congratulations well, on that you. Thank you so much for spending this time. I love being able to catch up in a public forum. I'm going to be in L.A. the first week of March. Maybe we can oh. get a taco. I'll oh, text absolutely. you about it. You know, we'll do the thing. But uh, really appreciate your time and talent, man. Oh, thank you for having me on. I mean, man, the folks you've had on your podcast are <laughs> it's a, it is a high bar you set so yeah it's an honor to be included oh man you're you're right up there congratulations on going after your dreams and making them happen man very very cool and to all the listeners out there if you love the podcast be sure to subscribe share rate and review it really does help people find the podcast through all those crazy algorithms and uh, maybe on the next episode we'll have our co-producer Longtime friend Jim McCarthy with us, Jim McCarthy VoiceOvers.com. Adam, I'll be seeing you real soon. Thanks for joining us, man. Hope so. Yeah, cheers. Take care, Rich. See you guys. This has been the Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredman.com forward slash podcasts. <laughs>